So when challenged um, with coming up with a presentation for today, I thought, you know, what is it that I can add to your life? And so I thought to tell you my story, and that is of creating the business that I now run, Design Futurist. While in university, I had a challenge. I basically wanted to drop out because I was studying fashion and I thought, God, this is so boring. How could I have spent $60,000, two years of my life, to be told to study Vogue and to work with textiles that were about 10 years old and technology that's about 200 years old? So with the, with the, you know, the goal of graduating and getting a diploma, which was very important to me and to my family, I, I, I had to figure out something to do. So what I did was research, and I found this new area in fashion called wearable technology. And wearable technology, as I understand it, is the integration of fashion and technology, computing and design. And so I went out and I positioned myself as an innovation guru, having no portfolio. And I said, DuPont, I'll work for you. Give me your technology. Show me what you have you know, in your coffers, and I'll come up with something. And so, oddly enough, they agreed. This was one of my first projects. I worked in a collaborative with um, an electrical engineer and an interface designer. I was a product designer on the case. And basically what happened, I created a product that could conduct electricity using a DuPont material, which is a conductive fiber. It's a wire that's about as thin as a thread. And so integrating that wire into clothing and working with an electrical engineer to show me how to create circuitry and open and close circuits, uh, we created a device that could power cell phones, MP3 players, and pretty much anything that you could imagine um, as long as you had the battery power behind it. And so this was my first successful product de design. And it went on to uh, create a toolkit that founded a $10 million business, which went on to sell over $100 million in licensed technology. Uh, my next invention, and this is while I'm in college, was a photoluminescent top, which I think is really fun, because I, you know, while running one day in New York City, where I'm from, I was thinking, you know, there has to be a way to, to be better illuminated. Um, and, and most of the people at the time told me, you have to use LEDs, LEDs are the way to go, they're really cool. And I thought, well, they're kind of nerdy, and I don't want to have batteries in my clothing. I had just experienced that. So I did some research, and so I looked out and I saw that through phosphorescence, you can actually uh, light objects. And so working with a textile company in Korea created a um, fabric that actually emits light. And principally it absorbs light, in the daytime or whenever it's exposed to light and emits it in the darkness as this funny glow-in-the-dark color. But the interesting bit about this product design, because I'm sure you've all seen glow-in-the-dark, is that it's not painted on, it's not a surface treatment, it's actually a part of the fiber. So the textile itself is phosphorescent and uh, this was a first of kind. And so I went on to create more and more products, looking at new ways to invent things, working with technologists to apply their materials, and to come up with uh, exciting inventions. So we reached the end of college, and I had the fortune of graduating as designer of the year from a very good design school. And what I did with that was start a company. And I went on to the world and I said, look at my portfolio now. I have credibility. I can show you what I can do. And so the companies listed here hired me as a consultant. And with them, I created many, many more innovations. Um, this is an example of a product I designed for Calvin Klein, where I developed a proprietary finish to uh, treat their denim and create a new cool line of rusted denim. Working with Donna Karen and DKNY Men's Collection, again, looking at new ways to uh, disrupt their supply chain using uh, laser bonding technology to put the garments together. New interesting uh, design concepts there. And along the way, I like to say that I, I hit a speed bump. I had a, a, a moral conflict. Um, I, I had the, the, the pleasure of working with factories and with designers inside production houses. And I saw what happened. I saw that it was women, it was children, who were making the textiles that I was working with. I saw that there was so much waste going into the fashion supply chain. So I decided I had to do something about it. 
I decided that there was no way that I can continue with these novel products, as much fun as they are and as probably as interesting as they are, I had to do something about fashion and its unsustainability. So I, sh I shifted gears with my business and I started to think about sustainability as innovation. But before I could get there, mind you, I had to learn what is sustainability. So today when I talk about sustainability, the first question people ask me is what does that mean? And I say, well, it doesn't mean one thing. In my opinion, it's a series of informed trade-offs. Um, and it, it's a desire to make something that's beneficial to society today and for generations to come. But what I'd like to do is walk you through how I learned about sustainability because it's really about assessing the entire life cycle or the value chain of making a, a piece of clothing. So, starting with the fiber, you have the farmer. And in the wonderful world of fashion, of glamour and beauty, the farmer is typically, in the third world, spraying deadly chemicals uh, without any protection. So 25% of the world's insecticides are used to grow conventional cotton, something that many of us may think is natural. Textiles, as beautiful as they may be, approximately 8,000 chemicals are used to make one item of clothing. Sewing, 200-year-old technology, if not further. 50% of the factories in the United States are sweatshops. This is the US Labor Department statistic, 50%. So it's not a third world issue, it's right here at home. As a designer, I was not taught anything about what goes into making a product. But again, faced with this challenge of designing sustainable products, I had to learn what are the inputs. So in a, typ a typical garment, which actually lasts around six months in someone's closet, you have 1,400 gallons of water going into a pair of jeans, about 800 gallons going into a t-shirt. This, in, a, in, a, in an economy that says design for obsolescence, right? The very definition of fashion is temporary. It means of the time. US consumers account for 60% of consumption yet we only make up about 12% of the world's population. Again, sustainability issue. So now the product has been sold to, to us here. And one of the things I learned is that sustainability isn't just how you make it or what you make it with, but it's also what happens after it leaves the department store. So most of the footprint of a garment comes well after it's been made. It's actually during the use phase. It's that laundering, the drying, the constant wash and heat, the energy that goes into it, the effluents which come out of it, and uh, the water use, of course. Now, we've invested all of this energy, resources, labor, costs, which have been externalized, and only to end up in a landfill in about six months. So the average American throws away about 68 pounds of clothing and textiles per person per year. This in, in, in a recession that's arguably the worst since the Great Depression. So now that I've maybe depressed you with the, <laughs> the statistics or the facts, this is basically what I had to do as a designer, to look along the entire value chain, to look along the life cycle, the ecosystem of fashion, and not just jump on the bandwagon of some greenwashing phenomenon saying, hey, everybody use organic, or hey, everybody do this. Really, as a designer, it's extremely important to be informed about the entire process. And so, in my search for solutions to the fiber issue that we talked about, I came across um, an, an interesting fact. And that is that there are some historical textiles, such as flax, hemp, organic cotton, which have been used for thousands of years, sustainably, harvested without in insecticides, pesticides, without irrigation of water. And so, the, the good news is that these materials are in demand. Though they make up less than 1% of the total textile market space, the, it's a supply side issue. The demand is greater for these materials than ever before. Moving on to the labor side issue. Factories are a mess. And one of the greatest technologies that's disrupting factory-based uh, production is 3D printing. And that is, in essence, uh, construction on demand. And so, 
we know about this perhaps through resin-based 3D printing for uh, hard goods, but what's happening in the fashion world is a movement towards 3D printing of soft textiles. And so this is going to allow us to shift from creating excess inventory, which in and of itself is unsustainable, but also eliminate that factory worker and put computation to work in an industry that has rejected um, any sort of technology. As a designer, one of the things we're taught to do is design kind of recklessly. Season to season, reverie to reverie, inspiration to inspiration. But there's a, there's a change happening, and that's the development of clothing that'll last, not just in and of its, not in its material sense, but also in its aesthetic sense. So designing classics, and the image shown here is of a young lady who's wearing the same dress for an entire year and just restyling it with new accessories. And the, the, the focus is to get the excess out and to really hone in on what it is that's gonna make us look good and feel good and last for a while. In order to achieve eco-friendly products, it's not about just what goes into the actual design of the product, but it's actually how the product is used during its life, life cycle. So consumer behavior is really key. And there are some basic low-tech things that people can do, such as wash their clothes in cold water, hang dry their clothing, but there are also some cool innovations happening uh, in terms of uh, technology and, and laundering. So what I have uh, pictured here is basically a washing machine that's waterless. Um, and it's using UV technology to kill the bacteria in your clothing uh, instead of the typical suds in water. Um, again, water being, what is it, about 3% of uh, the, the water in the world is, is drinkable fresh water. So I think that's a pretty valuable uh, natural resource. And uh, there are many innovators in the fashion space that are looking to preserve it and protect it. And finally, the disposal issue, which to me is kind of, a, it's the most exciting, the waste issue. Um, in general, people are looking at ways that we can close the loop. So as a designer, I was trained to not only think in silos, but to think linearly. And so now I'm taking those two points and putting them together. And what I have photoed here is a, uh, it's a product called Sonic Fabric. And Sonic Fabric takes cassette tape, which is pretty much a useless technology, or at least an outdated one. And instead of putting it into the bin, or whatever the case may be, hiding it somewhere in storage, there's a woman who's out there making this fabric into a new textile, a premium textile, that is. And I think it's really interesting because we often talk about recycling, and we think of it as downcycling, so taking something that once had a great deal of value and making it into a new product, which generally has less value. Well, this person's taken it and made something that's fantastic. These things are selling in Barneys, they're moving up the, the value chain, and it's a great example of a movement that's happening. Um, Bill McDonough talks about it, cradle to cradle, but fundamentally there's so many people out there doing this type of work, which I consider a closed loop design practice. And so, hopefully, what I've explained is how, at a young age, I've been able to take my ideas to the marketplace, and how, as an innovator, I've been drawn to sustainability as a practice, and how acting on my own impulse and my intuition and applying my energy um, and applying my, my curiosity, I've learned about this new space. And fundamentally, I see it as the wild, wild west. I just came back from China, and, and everyone around the world is really interested in how do we transform these industries, these business models, these practices into sustainable ones. And, and another thing that I hope you walk away with is that it's not enough just to uh, react as a designer and say, well, I'm going to green this because greening it means a green materials. Hopefully what I've explained is that we as designers have to be informed and to look at the entire life cycle, the parts that we're not even involved in, such as when the consumer takes home our product and how that consumer is going to engage with that product. So thank you very much. Thank you.